Well, hey everyone, and welcome back to A Courier's Tale. I'm hoping I'll be able to finish it up this time, but I have no idea how long the game is, so we'll see. Now, you might recall that last time I was debating between whether I was going to take the boat I'm at right now with the nice guy and new stuff, or wait for the next one because this guy having new stuff might be a sign that he is a murderer. Well, I'm just going to take this one because... Live life fast and dangerous. That's totally a good idea. YOLO! At first, things work out well. You stand in front of the gondola with your bike and bag beside you and make good progress through the submerged streets, past the tops of old traffic lights and road signs. Things take a rather bad turn when you feel a sharp crack at the back of your head. New gondola, sharp suit. Of course the thing was dodgy. In a daze you realize that you are heading over the side of the boat. You drown. Had you been murdered two months earlier, the toxicity of the water would have meant you were poisoned. This is of little comfort though. If only you had a time machine and could wait for a different gondola. My suspicions were confirmed. I'm never trusting anyone in this game ever again. Except Sorcha and maybe that other guy, who, Casino. He seemed okay. Okay, so let's wait for a different gondola this time. That looks too good to be true. You wave him on. The torrent of abuse that pours from his mouth suggests that you might have made the right decision. It is a good 10 minutes before the next gondola arrives. You are just starting to feel a bit tense about the time. This gondolier looks like your average gondolier. Grumpy, tired, with one massively overdeveloped shoulder. She also has a passenger already. You inquire as to their destination. It's a little out of the way and will double the time it will take to get to the cathedral quarter. There's no telling when the next gondola will be along though. Will you take this boat or hang on for another one? I'm gonna go for this one. The other passenger is a woman with a huge amount of shopping. It's all from the designer boutiques up near the academies, where all the elderly artists are forced to work. Now there is not much money to spend on their art. You only just fit because she refuses to move. She spends the first half of the journey complaining about you and then the second half changing her mind about where she wants to go. After a whole hour, the gondolier has had enough and makes her disembark in the riverside sector, miles away from where you want to be. You radio Sorcha and explain, given that you've just messed up the job so badly there won't be any payment, never mind bonuses, she is pretty nice to you. She does warn you to stay away from Casino for the foreseeable future though. You picked the wrong gondola. If only you could go back and pick again. This is insanity. Okay, so let's wait for the next, next one this time. You decide to wait. You wait and wait. Then you wait some more. Is there no such thing as a good decision in this universe? You're about to wish you'd taken the second gondola when you hear the jaunty swish of another one arriving. You wave and he hurls abuse at you and your bike and your mother. And she isn't even here. He stinks. You're not sure what of, but it's nasty and it probably lingers. His left arm has been amputated and he has had his oar attached so his arm is nearly six feet long and ends in a paddle. He is clearly a psychopath. Uh, on the other hand, you have a delivery to make. Will you take this third gondola or wait for a fourth? Honestly, at least this guy is an obvious threat. With the way the other guys went, they seemed decent enough and turned out to be terrible choices. This guy seems like a terrible choice, so therefore, it's probably the best decision, especially since I'm already super late. But oh my gosh, this game. The man curses you as you board, but once you have set off, he calms down. He moves the gondola through the water as though he were one with his boat. He sails like Sorcha cycles. You are making incredible progress through the submerged streets. This gondolier is truly a master of his craft. Well, I mean, when you have a paddle for a hand, you'd better be good at it. The gondola arrives at your destination, gliding gently up to the edge of the water. You pay the gondolier and he gives you his card as a receipt. You're Gunter Armstrong, you say? But you're a legend! He's such a legend you thought he didn't exist. When he was a young man, late teens maybe, the flood hit the city and he went on a wooden pallet armed only with a snooker cue and a bottle of whiskey and saved the lives of over 5,000 men, women, and children on his own. Days it took. 
Now, you're pretty sure that it wasn't that many. Maybe every time the tale was told, a couple of people have been added, but it's how he lost his arm, his family, and his dog. His name isn't even Armstrong. That name was bestowed upon him by grateful rescued people who would live to see the economic and environmental ruin firsthand. Better that than a watery grave though, eh? Gunter just grins and asks you what address you're delivering to. He points up the road and then pats you on the head. You may never wash your hair again. That's gross. I, I don't even care. You cycle off, not even getting your feet wet, so skillful was Gunter's parking, to find your destination. You need number five. You can see number four, a large granite townhouse with columns on either side of the front door. And number six, which is the mansion where the Cardinal lived way back when most of the Cathedral Quarter wasn't elegant ruins. Up and down you ride, up and down, until at last you spot a tiny archway hiding number five and knock on the door. You have to knock again because no one answers the first time, but in the end, a very tall, elegant man opens the doors. You look down the hallway behind him, and it's like looking into the past. There's an open door at the other end that appears to lead to a black hole. You feel nauseous. Ah, the decoy package, the man says. Marvelous. Thank you. You look blankly at him. The code, please, the man says, on the back. You turn the package over and give him the code that is on the back. You'll need to call that in and take the package back to your office, he says with a smile. First day? On a job this big, you say, smiling back. He seems like a nice man, very calming. He thanks you and shuts the door. You stand alone in the quiet streets for a moment. Your work is done here, so you ride back to pack it, satisfied that you have done your job and done it well. Okay. Yeah, I didn't think that was going to be an ending. When you arrive back at the office, Sorch and Casino are waiting outside with their bikes. Roach is leaning against the doorframe, scratching his head. Hey there, Casino says. Congratulations, first decoy run. How does it feel? You shrug, modest to the end. Three very important words, Casino says, holding up three fingers, one for each word. Big. Fat. Bonus. Sorry I couldn't check up on you too much, Roach said. I had to follow him with the real package. What did you have in yours, Sorcha says to you. Turns out I had a fish. I thought it smelled funny. Viral media campaign, apparently. Let me see yours, Casino says to you. You get the package out of your bag and hand it to him. Casino inspects the package as though he's trying to guess what's inside without opening it. Okay, so I'm going to guess that inside of my package... Let's see, one of them already had a dead animal, so I'm not going to guess that. What would be the opposite of a dead animal? Perhaps a potted plant? Yeah, let's go with that. It's a potted plant. Specifically, a bonsai ficus. Let's go. Casino opens the package and smiles at the disc inside, then at you. As I thought, he hands it to Sorcha. She looks at it and hands it back to you with a wide grin. You want to hang on to that, she says. Might be useful. We should go, Roach says. He's smiling at you, too. They are odd, but you like them. New person, Yum shouts from his chubby hole. I got exciting job for you, as this lot are too lazy to do it. Knocking off time, Casino says. Tell him to shove it. <laughs> you don't, though. You are so excited and pleased with yourself, you take it. You zip off to the project with a whirl in your pedal and a song into your heart. You pick up a package from a strange office near the entertainment center and ride out to the project. Nothing interesting happens apart from you nearly getting crushed by an enormous lorry that's come over from the continent. A woman with a cat in a shoebox chases you down the street and the project security guard chews your tire to make sure it's not made of explosives. You suspect you have just delivered the plans to an invasion of the weather facility in the middle of the swollen river, but decide not to worry about it. On the way back to the heart of the city, you stop off at Wired and Buzzing, a coffee stall that is famous for its fabulous hot beverages. You're a regular customer, so the barista greets you with a great caffeine overdose introduced to bounce of enthusiasm. It's quite scary. We have a celebratory espresso or a chocolate milk. Personally, I don't drink coffee. Chocolate milk does sound delicious. This guy probably does drink coffee and might need the caffeine energy to get places. He probably won't deal with lag too much after, so let's go with the espresso. You knock back the fiery shot in one and feel it the jolt as the high-octane caffeine hits you full in the heart like an H-bomb. It's like someone turned everything up to 11, 12 perhaps. 
Your radio squeals and it sounds like an aria to you. It's yum. You see what he wants. New person, I have a new drop off for the decoy package, Yum says. You don't understand. How come? Listen, little beginner, Yum says. He seems to be chewing something while speaking to you. It wasn't a decoy, it was a delay. If you don't want it, it will wait until tomorrow. Bonus for delivering today is a paltry. What's the address? You figure if it's a long way, you'll take it tomorrow. He tells you. It's strange. It's in the northwest sector. You've never delivered there because there's nowhere to deliver to. The poor people live in the northwest sector. It's a lawless, desperate place filled with artists and vandals. You live there, but the address takes you a few miles out of your way. Still, it's bound to be an interesting job, given its location. Well, well, Yum says. Decide. We don't have all day, and you are on overtime. Yum hates overtime. It's expensive. Will you take the run to the northwest sector, or knock off for the day? I mean, I live there, so it's kind of on the way anyway. I think I'll go for it. Why not? You take the job, just out of curiosity. You make sure the package is still secure in your bag and set off. It's a short trip to the Arkin Park, and then you head up the old Roman road to the northwest sector. The further up you get, the more derelict everything becomes. Only the huge Advergonda screens pumping out public health information and corporate advertisement get any regular maintenance. They stick out like shiny thumbs on a sore hand. You have to concentrate on dodgy potholes and taxi drivers on their way to or from their shifts. You ride about a mile of boarded up houses, clumps of security guards posted outside to stop the homeless people from getting inside. You read somewhere that if all the empty properties in the city were made available for the people to live in, there would be five homeless people on the streets. And that due to chronic claustrophobia. The news feed you read that on was shut down just after they broadcast that. It was a tiny bit off message. You get off the main drag and take a shortcut down a road that has had the top layer of asphalt stripped from it. It makes for an interesting ride, which become downright riveting as a pack of dogs come howling out of a street side and aim themselves at your spokes. Are you going to try to outrun them or turn into the basin to try and lose them? Personally, I have biked with dogs before, and generally, I, I was able to keep up with them well enough, but they were definitely a lot more agile. If I'm going on a straightaway, I can get faster. This guy is a professional bicyclist, so he can probably go faster still, but in a basin, I don't know how he's going to try and lose them. I mean, traditionally, a basin isn't exactly a maze. Again, this is another one of those decisions where the right answer isn't really obvious or even necessarily something that you can figure out, so I'll just try to outrun them. The dogs are a motley crew of mongrel mutts and pampered pedigree pooches. It's the posh dogs you have to watch out for. After the flood, pets were a luxury that only the very, very, very rich could afford. And the streets were full of strays. Dogs, cats, rabbits, guinea pigs, fish! The fish fared best. The rabbits suffered most. Because of the food shortages, they were caught and eaten. The dogs breed like the rabbits would have done, and a few years ago, a failed cull resulted in a population. <laughs> A population explosion. Oh, this is some this is some high-grade humor here. How the pedigree breeds remain so pure is something you don't want to think about. Somehow, they still seem to know that they should be lounging around on plush sofas in elegant drawing rooms instead of scavenging on the streets with the canine scum. It has made them very bitter. The packs snap at your ankles, and there is a tense moment where a greyhound with ribs like a toast rack outstrips you and tries to knock you off balance, but after two miles, they give up. You can still hear the black horse-sized beast barking when you are a mile away. You get your head down and pedal, avoiding eye contact with anyone until you arrive at the delivery destination. The address is a corner shop. It's all shuttered up and locked with the flimsiest lock you have ever seen. You could snap it open with your bare hands. Not that you would. No one else seems to have done either. This is odd, given that there's a bottle shop opposite that sells all the illegal substances that anyone would need to fuel a ram raid of the nice, genteel shop. 
There isn't a scrap of graffiti on the shutter either. You can smell oranges coming through the tight mesh, and someone has taped a sign up saying back soon. A little further down the street is a cafe with a red and blue sign over its front window and door. In greasy clives, it says. You wonder how soon soon is. You could go into the cafe and ask there. It's the safest place open, or hang about outside the shop for a bit. Well, if the cafe is safe, then that's probably the best way to go. Presumably, I can keep an eye on the place while I'm in there. Hanging about outside could also prove prudent, considering that the person might be back immediately. But they also might be super paranoid and will refuse to come back if someone is waiting outside, so I'm gonna wait in the cafe. You lock your bike to some railings. You use every security device you have, so it takes a few minutes. Then you wander over to the cafe. A bell gives a cheerful ting as you open the door and go in. The only customer is a woman who is only as tall as she is wide. You can only just see over the counter. She is wearing so many rings and bangles, you're surprised she can lift her arm up. She's wrapped in a very bright piece of fabric, which has been elaborately folded. You hope so it doesn't come unraveling. There's a man in a filthy apron behind the counter, polishing a glass on a rag that looks as though something died in it. This must be Clive. Excuse me, you say. Do you know if the shop up the road is going to be open again today? Why? He says. Yes, why? The woman says. Do you want to buy something? No, I have a delivery, you say. I'm a courier. We've got plenty of couriers around here, Clive says. For some reason, he laughs at this. A courier, the woman says. Follow me. Clive tuts, an impressive noise like a gunshot. You could have strung it out so I could sell something. I've got all these sandwiches left. The only good thing about these couriers is that they're hungry all the time. Now Clive, the woman says as she bustles toward the door like Galoon on rough seas. You know that's not the only good thing about them. She beckons you to the door and you follow her back to the shop. Looks like I made the right decision. You are a friend of Sorcha's, the woman says. She said you might be coming. You nod, which is pointless because the woman is leading the way and can't see you. Unless she has eyes in the back of her head that can see through hair. Which... she might. Let's open the shop and have a sit down, she says. The problem with having such little legs is that they get tired quickly. I bet I wouldn't even reach the pedals of your bike. That Minos tried to get me on a tricycle. He's a very naughty man. You don't know who Minos is, but he sounds like he would be fun to hang around with. The woman chatters on, fitting a surprising amount of words into the short walk up the road. She is babbling on and on and being so warm and welcoming that you, citizen of this city that you are, start to wonder if she might not be up to something. If this whole thing isn't some kind of trick. She pulls up the shutter and any suspicious thoughts you had disappear when you see her stock all laid out. You go into the shop with her, lost in wonder. Who is this woman and how does she know Sorcha? The shop is quite dark, which only adds to the mystery and amazement. My name is Hagia, the woman says. You murmur yours in reply as you gaze around the shop. At the front are crates of fruit and vegetables piling up. There are green lettuces and cucumbers alongside bright red tomatoes and carrots that are a shade of orange that make you dizzy. There's aubergines. Aubergines? I don't know what that is. And some things that you think might be peppers. You've read about them. I get them from the sky people, Hagia says. I'm not sure how. They just arrive. You wander up an aisle made of shelves full of noodles and pasta and tinned produce that you have only dreamed of. I'll make you up a bag if you like. On the house. Hagia is smiling at you as she waddles up the aisle behind you. You go down the next aisle. There is a shelf with... Uh, five shallow boxes of colorful plastic figures in them. They are in different poses, and three of them almost look familiar, but you can't quite place them. On the shelf below them, comics are piled up. You flick through one. It's a subversive, underground type story, different to your average superhero material. Hagia is looking at you with great interest. I'm sorry, you say. I have a package for you. Oh, that's not actually for me, Hagia says. They sometimes use me as a dummy drop for things. Could you do me a favor? The last aisle is full of cleaning products and a small gadgets, which is unusual for two reasons. Firstly, they 
are available in the northwest sector and secondly they are priced far below what you would expect if you saw them in a shop in the north or riverside sectors if you are allowed in one of those shops of course you're not the right kind of citizen hagia is scribbling on a scrap of paper would you mind delivering the package to this address she hands you the paper it's just around the corner you notice a strange twinkle in her eye what do you think do you say yes or no i think she seems trustworthy enough I should probably be more suspicious considering this world is a horrible place, but I feel like if she was going to try and get me killed somehow, she would have done it already. And if she wanted the package for some nefarious reasons, then she could have just taken it. So I'll just go with it. There is so much in this shop that is fascinating. The comics and figures, the pricing, Hagia herself. You decide you would be a fool to say no. You unlock your bike and Hagia waves you off her jewelry jangling like Christmas. She is still chatting away. The address is round the corner. It's an abandoned hotel all boarded up. There's one board that looks more door-like than the others, less fixed and forbidding. You knock on it. It reverberates and makes an impressive amount of noise. Nothing happens. The hotel stands as before, silent and shut up. Will you knock again or forget about it? No, I mean, I have a package to deliver, so I think I'll knock again. You are determined to deliver the package for Hagia. She seems like a very nice woman, she knows Sorcha, and you can afford to buy a media sync headset at her shop. You really, really want a media sync headset that's the smallest draw. You knock again. Nothing happens. You knock again. There is a scraping sound and a dark gap appears in the board. From it comes first a babble of chatter and laughter, and second, the ginger head of a man with a grin almost as wide as his freckled face. Hello, he says. You were quick. He holds out his hand. Here you are. You give him the package. This is the music we've been waiting for, he says as he rips the package open. You can't have a party without music. It sounds like they are having quite a party. You remember Sorcha had said you might want to hand onto the package. You wonder what's going on. You want to come in, he says. We have spectacular booze. Do you join the party, or make your excuses? Technically, I'm on the job, but at the same time, I think with the package delivered, I'm pretty much done. I don't know. The place seems kind of sketchy. That, and like coffee, alcohol is a thing which I do not drink. This guy might, but I'm gonna go with my better judgment and say, nah. You are kidding me, right? You've come this far and you're going home? I don't think so. You turn yourself around and get in there. Right now, go on, go and join the party. What do you even ask me for? Like, this has happened a few times now, where it gives you an option, but no matter which one you pick, it just makes you go this way anyway. Like with the fire escape, it, last episode, I chose not to take that, and then it's the only option. Now I choose not to go to the party, and no, go to the darn party. Why not just tell me to go if you're gonna force me to go anyway? At the very least, they should craft their dialogue trees a bit more subtly. You accept the invitation. The ginger head disappears and the gap opens a little wider. A hand appears. I'm Minos, he says as he shakes you by the hand. You tell him your name as he drags you through the gap and into the hotel. It's tatty and dilapidated, but it's still grand. It must have been one of the five-star hotels that used to pack in celebrities and politicians 30 years ago. The walls are covered in gig posters and a large mural of urban life that you think was done by the graffiti artist whose name is a string of numbers you can never remember. Despite the lack of music, there is still quite a party going on. They must have a hundred people in the lobby and disappearing up the stairs. A bit quiet still, Minos says, but it's really early so don't judge us too harshly. Now, I bet you are in need of a drink after a busy day on the road. You agree that you are thirsty and follow him to address this issue. You follow Minos through the lobby. There's a woman you almost recognize standing talking to a man you do recognize. He is Stark. A famous artist, rebellious, he's a thorn in the side of the Ministry of Culture and Endeavor. She looks a bit like one of the figurines in Hagia's shop. How strange. That's Lola, Minos says. You'll meet her later, I'm sure. Minos leads you into an enormous kitchen. It's just the size you would need to service a hotel restaurant. There are lots of people in here, but uh, through the crowd you can see Sorcha. 
She's perched on a worktop next to a gigantic refrigerator, talking to a man who looks like he just came back from a pilgrimage. Hello, Sorcha says. You made it. Sorry about the unorthodox invitation. I'm going to go and give this to Loki, Minos says, waving the disc around and almost taking the man's eye out. Get our new friend a drink. As he disappears into the crowd, Sorcha opens the fridge. The door swings open to reveal every beverage, alcoholic and non-alcoholic, you could desire. Help yourself, she says. This is Prophet. Hello, he says. I've just heard all about you. Not that they have to explain anything to me. I think they just like the input of an elderly gentleman. You can't tell how old he might be. He could be ancient or not that old at all. You shake Prophet's hand. Now, Prophet says to Sorcha, what is he talking about? Sure, she says and nods to someone over your shoulder. All right, Casino says. He's standing next to Lola, and on her other side is Roach. You can just about make out Minos behind him. There's no time to wonder what's going on, because Prophet has cleared his throat in a very pretentious manner. <coughs> you pay attention, despite the insistent beat of some amazing music having started up somewhere in the hotel. Right, here's the question for you, he says. You have arranged to meet Minos at the dock, where he works, to collect some small and portable computer device he has lifted off a salvaged ship. On the way, you notice a very attractive person, who is exactly your type, standing by the side of the road. They are trying to get your attention, flagging you down, and what have you. They are extremely attractive, and you know that they are interested in you romantically. How do you know that? Minos asks. Don't interrupt, Lola says. Carry on, Prophet. So there's this gorgeous person at the side of the road, waiting for you to attend to them. Do you stop and see what they want, or do you make haste and help your comrade Minos? What's your answer? Do you stop for a romantic interlude, or hurry to Minos and his contraband? Yeah, I'm definitely gonna just stick with the job, because anyone who is just immediately and obviously romantically interested with some random bike courier is probably bad news. You know, like that zoot suit guy who murdered me at the gondola. So, contraband. That's right, Prophet says. Mino hisses a triumphant, yes! With clenched fists, and Roach slaps you on the back so hard you almost swallow your tongue. Reclamation and fencing, Lola says, very important in our business. You wonder what's going on here, but as it seems to be going well, you decide to get on with it. No questions asked on your part. Next question, Prophet says, and solemn order is restored. An Enforce officer asks for your help. They have been badly beaten by one of the McBride family. There is no vehicular access, but if you do not get them to a medical center, they will bleed to death. However, you are carrying an illegal weapon, some banned substances, and a bag full of stolen car parts. Do you help this agent of the oppressor, or hurry away? Would you come to the aid of the officer, or move right along, because there is nothing to see here other than your own arrest? Honestly, I'm probably going to have to go with the Good Samaritan on this one. Hopefully, since the dude is about to bleed out, he wouldn't be able to be in enough shape to arrest me anyway. So, yeah, I'll help out a guy. Torture High Fives Casino. Very important to recognize that the uniform is not even skin deep in some cases, he says. You remember Vermina and Tixelix? Well, you remember Vermina. She seemed friendly. This is the final question, Prophet says. You are invited to a party organized by the Ministry of Culture and Endeavor. You pull a very doubtful face, as it seems very unlikely that this would ever happen. Stark invited us, Lola says. Happens a lot. This party, Prophet says, in a voice that invites Hush around him, is attended by many rich and high-profile individuals, and you are a bit nervous about going. Do you hop yourself up on all manner of chemical substances to make sure you have a great time, or do you come up with a strategy for the party with the rest of the gang? This is a tricky one. You can't quite see what he is getting at. Will you confess your fears to Sorcha and her socially adept friends, or get tanked up and hope for the best? Well, you might have figured out by now, by the fact that I don't drink coffee and don't drink alcohol, that I'm not really huge on any sort of substances, so... I'm just gonna play it safe and confide in my friends. Good advice. Don't do drugs, kids. Good job, good job, Minos says. I'll go and unlock the control room. Prophet puts his hands on your shoulders and stares deep into your eyes. It's like he's looking into your soul. Well done, he says. Now go forth and be awesome. 
You look at Sorcha for some kind of clue. She hops off the worktop and points over to the busy kitchen. Let's go somewhere we can talk. It's about to go mad in here. True, Casino says. This track has quite a drop in it. Send the dance floor wild. You suspect that everywhere in here is a dance floor. You follow Sorcha out of the kitchen and see that she's right. You cross the lobby, past the lifts, and through a games room. Roach knocks on a discreet door and Minos opens it. Beyond lies a quieter room. The room is dim, lit with a bluish light from a few fluorescent tubes hanging from the ceiling. The air is alive with the hum of electronic equipment. Almost every flat surface is covered with a computer or receiver of some sort, all whirring away. There is a large whiteboard on one wall covered with cryptic notes that you don't understand. Goods incoming, Minos says. He points to a list on the right-hand side. And buyers. Enforce radio channels, Roach says, as he points to a table full of black boxes and wires. I thought you were couriers, you say to Sorch and Casino. Casino laughs. Only for the citizen card. We've got quite a complex operation, Sorcha says. There's no point telling you all about it now. It would take too long. Not before we ask you one more question, Lola says. Okay, you say. We need another pair of hands, Sorcha says. Someone clean who Enforce won't suspect, but someone who can handle themselves, be relied on, not take unnecessary risks. You, Casino says. Me, you say. What do you think, Sorcha says. Want to join the Vanguard? What do you think? Will you join up, or give it a miss? Well, again, for the sake of the story, it's pretty obvious that I have to join up, so let's do that. The Vanguard. That sounds familiar. That was the name of the mercenaries in Hagia's shop, the comics and the figurines, the Vanguard. You realize now why the models look so familiar, because they are standing right in front of you. Sorcha, Minos, Casino, Lola, and Roach are the Vanguard. And now... So are you. And that is the end. Okay, that was interesting, confusing, and annoying at times, honestly, but good enough that I can overlook it. Honestly, this game makes me want to find out what the rest of the story is about, this Vanguard trilogy. It sounds interesting. I might just check it out. If you guys like this, then I suggest you check it out, and hopefully there will be more of stuff like this in the future, because I actually thought this was really interesting. Though, honestly, I'm hoping the next text-based game I get into is a bit shorter, because this was pretty long with a nice bit of backtracking to it. The arbitrary decisions could have been less arbitrary, I guess. You know, things that don't particularly make a lot of sense. Like, why they would even include something as a choice when they're just gonna force you to do one thing anyway, or why they would have such seemingly unimportant decisions lead to death. But one way or the other, it was a pretty fun game. Interesting story, lots of reading, but that's what text-based games are all about. And again, I'm a pretty big fan of the choose-your-own-adventures type books and stories, so to me, this was fun. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and if you like it or want to suggest something else, just say something down in the comments, and I'll be sure to read and reply. And as always, I'll see ya.